Good evening. Hi, everybody. Uh, on behalf of the PGA, uh, One Guild Women's Impact Network, WIN, I'd like to welcome you to the fifth session of the Equity in Our Industry series. Uh, in this uh, six-part series, we began our discussions with how we can make meaningful change toward equity in our industry by um, through writing and development uh, to casting and crewing up. And this evening, our panel will be addressing marketing and distribution and institutional change. And this panel will share strategies on how to market to diverse audiences and which distributors have found success reaching their audiences and how they did it. My name is Deborah Pratt, proud WIN member, and I will be your moderator today. Um, I'd like to introduce our panel, Jeff Friday, President and CEO of the American Black Film Festival. Great event. Um, good. good to see you again, Jeff. Great uh, to see you, Deborah. <laughs> Ken Sanderson, President, Acquisitions of Ancillary Distribution at Bleecker Street Media. Love your movies. Uh, Sana Sony uh, is the Senior Sales Manager of Distribution at 1091 Pictures. Also love your movies. And uh, Kenny Gravillis, Gravillis as uh, co-founder, Chief Creative Officer, Gravillis Inc. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. And let's go. So to set the stage, can we start with the basics and discuss how distribution and marketing plans are created generally and how they vary for each of your needs? Who wants to start? Oh, don't jump in at once. <laughs> it depends. I'll start. <laughs> Um, so I will say I'm a little new to 1091 picture, but I was at a distributor earlier too. And um, it just depends on the film so much. Each of the films requires such a different kind of distribution model and strategy. So uh, not all of them go to theatrical. Most don't, of the companies that I've worked at. Um, they might go straight to home entertainment. So the question is how long are they gonna be up for home entertainment, which is both DVD and transactional. Um, is there an opportunity for a next window or pay one or pay two? And if there isn't, that's when it comes to me. I'm in the ad supported business. So I'm uh, sort of the last person in the line here in the life cycle. And um, there might even be some films that we pick up that come directly to me in ad supported. So there's, there's many different ways it can go. That's the first place we kind of start. And of course, uh, if we're looking at submissions, there's other commercial factors we'll be looking at too, which are the obvious ones. I, I just add that I think, and my background is, it was, I spent 15 years in advertising in New York. And so I'm kind of got a different, uh, kind of an interesting perspective to marketing film. I think too much energy and time is spent on um, target audience and, and race as it relates to audience. You know, I truly believe, and I've always believed that and, and Kenny and, and, and the Gravelous family, they do great key art, right? And, and I think we spend too much focus on the race or the ethnicity of what we think the target audience is, audience is and not enough focus on the universal appeal of movies. That's just my philosophy about how we tend to pigeonhole movies based on who we think the, who the lead actor might be and how that might relate to the audience that we're trying to reach. I definitely want to come back and d dive into that a little bit deeper. Um, what about you, uh, Kenny? Yeah, so it's interesting. So by the time things get to our company, uh, our agency, um, you know, it, it really gets into strategy of like, okay, where we go, where's this film going? Like, or, you know, like Sani said, is it going to be a direct, uh, you know, direct streaming? Or is it going to be in a movie? Because just those two things in itself, like change how we actually market and like even the images that we, we work on basically. Um, I, I'm a big believer of what Jeff said in the sense that when it comes to race and, and how we market, I, I believe in like emotional resonance. It's like, I think that a campaign is when it can like resonate with you emotionally, like that's what makes it strong and that's what makes it broad and that's what makes it go beyond just race. And I think that can happen for any campaign, whoever's in it, whether someone's black or white or green or whatever. So like, I think for us personally, we're always trying to look at like, what is that emotional resonance? What is that iconic image that sort of can resonate with an audience? Uh, but yeah, we have to deal with strategy though. We have to deal with marketing people telling us 
well, you know, we want to hit this audience. So we need this image. Um, so that's always where sort of the challenge comes in a lot of times. What'd you got, Ken? So, I mean, for us, it, it's, uh, I think it's, it's similar to 1091, uh, except that, you know, we've generally been a very theatrical driven company. So most of our, uh, well, all of our releases have, has, have had some version of a nationwide theatrical release, whether that's 300 screens or uh, 3000 screens. Um, obviously during the pandemic, we've, we've pivoted and we've, we've, we have developed, uh, developed a more, I'd say pliable model between uh, what we're doing at Bleecker Street and also this new label, which uh, I'm now co-running with, with Neon uh, called Decal. Um, so from the very beginning, when we got into, when we jump onto a movie, we, we tend to think about, well, what is, what is the release strategy for this movie? Is this a, uh, what kind of theatrical re release could this be? Is this a, a hybrid, you know, we, we tend to, to not jump onto things unless we believe there's some real theatrical potential to it. Um, and then from there, we, we, we back into, you know, who do we, who do we think this movie is necessarily for? Um, you know, sometimes that can be an older skewing audience, but I think, what we generally look for, I think, to, to both Jeff and to Kenny's point is we look for movies that can cross over across all groups. Um, we tend to tell very emotional stories and, and jump onto those. So when we when we go for a nationwide release, whether that's theatrically or digitally, we are looking to hit a wide variety of audiences, even if we think it might lean towards one one or another. Um, but that, you know, uh, how, how far and wide we go, you know, will help to determine everything from our spend to our marketing materials. It really is a, a, a we, we've done such a, a wide array of movies at this point that, uh, and I think it's only going to get more, um, more spread out that I think that we, we tend to let the content speak first and then develop a plan around that. So, you know, playing off of that, do your plans change if the content has a majority black cast or a Latinx cast or an Asian cast or, I mean, do the, the visuals change that you put out? And I'll kind of jump on an example of, of that. Um, but you know what I'm asking in the sense that um, historically much of the challenges with marketing and distributing films with BIPOC casts uh, or content lie in international sales. And it is still difficult to attain pre-sales for a BIPOC cast uh, content or producers a start at the beginning. Do you see any of that changing in today's market? I think. I think that. I mean, and I, I've, I was. I was speaking with Julie about this a few days ago. I, I think that that. I don't think I'm saying anything new when I say that the international market has made it difficult um, to 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 get more stories told because of the way the independent film has been traditionally set up. The pre-sales model has always been, I think, unforgiving, um, in in a deeply unfair and, and silly way, and I think only now. Are things beginning to change? Not necessarily because I think that some of the older, you know, individual territory buyers are starting to wake up to the power of having a more diverse, you know, kinds of titles. But I think also that the the what it means to have an international release has started to change. That you have studios and streamers stepping up to to, to take on international rights, which frankly enables um, more stories to be told. I mean, I will, I, I would say there was there was a project I really wanted to make uh, a few years ago. Um, which uh, A24 ended up, ended up doing uh, an adaptation of Native Son. Um, and uh, one of the things that, that uh, we struggle as a US only distributor is we need to find international partners um, because we, we don't have an international, an international sales arm. We don't have a, uh, a UK office or a French office. We're, we're a US distributor. And it, it got to the point where I, I couldn't assemble enough of a coalition to, to get that movie made on time. Um, and it's, it's been one of the, the larger frustrations of my career. I think now what, what has been really liberating is to see Netflix, to see Apple, to see Universal and Sony step up more and, and more than they ever have, both on a worldwide basis and to, my, to Bleecker's own benefit on an international only basis, which enable movies to get financed, um, where you know, our, our interest in the US can be married with actual and robust interest internationally. Mm. Mm. Um. Now, we all know that in the past, there have been practices um, of changing the marketing for territories to downplay diversity. Um, the instance that I was discussing, I think it was with Julie, was when the Force Awakened poster reduced the image of John Boyega and the Italian um, and Korean posters of 12 Years a Slave reduced the prominence of Chiwetel Ejiofor, who was the star. Um, is that still occurring? 
and, and what needs to happen to change that practice? Um, I can speak a little bit to that just because, um, you know, those are the kind of conversations that we're having when we're working on posters. Um, and, it, you know, it's what's, what's interesting now, I do think just because of the, the world that we're in, uh, there's a little bit more pressure now to, um, I think, accept diversity. Um, and I, you know, even in just in marketing, you know, we just did a... Um, we just did a project for Amazon called Them, you know, and it's like, you know, there are billboards all around Los Angeles with black faces, you know, on these billboards. Like there's, it's a family of four black people and it's like, they're individually everywhere. And it's like, you know, I don't, you know, I think, you know, 10 years ago, I mean, that's just hard to see, you know? And it's like, now that's becoming more of a regular, you know, and I think to Ken's point, like the Amazons of the world, the Netflixes, the streamers, it's like, they're sort of, they're sort of a little bit off the studio system, right? They're, they're like, it's a little bit more wild west now in terms of how they're approaching things and like, you know, um, their openness to like push diversity. I, I, I do think we're actually in a place right now where more than ever um, we're, able to um to push diversity in marketing more than there there ever has been before quite frankly i really do and i do i also think that's also coming from just the reality of the dollars and cents that are connected to you know diverse diversity films i mean you know that's um lately there's been discussions and i'm sure people have heard about just like how much money hollywood is making and losing from not having, um, you know, diversity going on in their films. So I, I think, to, to be honest, you know, now you, when you start connecting it to money, um, <laughs> you start to change in terms of like who goes on a poster. I, I hate to say it, but, but having a, a more global approach to, to film marketing, I think is only good because you're, you're not necessarily leaning on these individual archaic individual territories. Mm -hmm. We're going to, to lean into some kind of misinterpretation they have of, of how the movie should be sold from their territory. The great thing about Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and the studios is that they operate on a worldwide basis right. and that they are able to more unilaterally say, this is the way this movie should be, this, this movie should be presented. I mean, I, as much as I love the streamers and we, we, we team up with them and we, we have a, a movie that just wrapped production with an entirely, entirely diverse cast and we partner with Universal on it. Um, and they've, they've been great partners and, and with us the entire way. Um, and I, I think that, that there, is, there is something that's changing um, and we're gonna work with them on a worldwide campaign. And I don't think there's gonna be any 12 years of slave um, uh, you know, stuff, uh, type incidents that are, that are really gonna happen. Uh, certainly, certainly not with this team. So, the, I, but, I, oh, so I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was just gonna say, I do think we also though, and I agree with what you both said, but have to acknowledge there have been some anti black kind of bias or prejudice around the world in some of the global markets. And I think Deborah, to your original question about John Boyega, I think really what drove the minimization of, of his image and Chiwetel's image was probably that, exactly that, a kind of an anti-black bias or prejudice in some of those particular territories. And I'm just not sure if, if the world is where America is right now. America's in a great, the United States, we're in a really great place about diversity. You know, we're forcing everyone to accept our, our differences. I'm just, I just don't know if, if where we are just psychologically and emotionally about diversity is gonna, is really the norm in some of the other countries, particularly like, in, I think the two examples you gave were in Asian countries, right? I just don't know if that's, if they're, they're quite there yet, for being honest. Yeah, and actually, I, just to bring up the point, you know, you also brought up Italy. And um, we just worked briefly on a project. And just like, just to bring this up, here we are, it's 2021. In Italy, there's a Netflix project that, um, I believe it's okay for me to mention it, that is um, literally showing the uh, diversity in Italy. And it's like, the, like, it's one of the most bizarre things ever because like you don't even think about it. But this, this actual show is, actually pushing like showing the black people that are living in italy and this is the show and it's like it's about you know italy having diversity and it's sort of like it's, it's such a massive deal you know and it's, it's such a big deal and that that kind of goes to to jeff's point like 
you know, there's a lot of countries out there that are not yet in that psychology. I mean, here we are in 2021, and we're really talking about the first show that is coming from Italy that really like shows black people in it. Sana, um, have you found that to be, um, have you found that to be true with, with the endeavors that you're taking, uh, some territories more diverse than others? Yeah, I will. So I will start off by saying that um, <clears throat> because we focus a lot on North America, oh, we are worldwide. We don't actually, I mean, again, I'm a little bit new, so we may have done this in the past. Uh, 1091 is new. It's, it formed two years ago, and before that, it was the orchard. They may have done this in the past, but recently, to, to my knowledge, there's one piece of art that is associated with a film, and uh, generally, it just favors the most uh, recognizable face. So that can be a person of color, uh, you know, as long as they're really, really recognizable. So that's the thing. We don't really make separate kinds of um, art for different countries. And again, in the ad supported world, it's just a matter of um, them deciding where they want to light up certain countries and in, in titles in certain countries. So it's not really like up to me to, to ask them to really make sure that if I tell them like this movie is great for Canada for you, that they'll actually do that. So ultimately it's, it's kind of out of my hands um, if that kind of answers your question. So it does, because it, it leads to the next question in a, in, a, in a way, in the sense that there must be territories. And what comes to mind is the John Boyega again. He was spokesman for uh, Joe Malone, and they replaced him in the Chinese version of the ad. And so there's, you know, there are definite territories that can they just take that away from you and recreate what you've done and recreate what you've put out and created? Well, one of the things you can do, um, right. and this is one of the advantages of doing something early, is um, is is contractually forbid them from doing so. Uh -huh. um, you know, so the credit obligations on the, on the film I just mentioned, um, it, it was you know the the way it was designed that on a worldwide basis, you literally cannot take any of the um, uh, the you cannot highlight actors that should not be highlighted. Our, our three leads are all are all people of color. They're, they will be on the key art. They will probably be the only people on the key art. Um, and if anybody who chooses to not do that uh, outside the US or anywhere else will be in breach of contract and they'll be opening up uh, larger problems for themselves. But I, th I think it is important. Um, and, and I have to say every actor, every member of, of, uh, of, of the, the movies we've been a part of where we're really trying to make this a priority, it's never been an issue. Um, but I think that you have to have that conversation early and, and have your eyes wide open when you're doing it. Yeah, I will say whatever art we make also contractually has to be the one going up. We control what we're putting up. If I focus right now on home entertainment, then if we make a title live on iTunes in multiple territories, we control the art 100%. So there's no way anyone else could come in and do it because we are the, the distributors and we own the rights. It, but to Ken's point, it comes down to the point where we can't even sometimes change the aspect ratio or cut down the shape of some art to a certain thing without getting a filmmaker's approval. So thankfully that's not a concern. I think that comes down to the, the John Boyega and She Wet Led You a Fourth thing comes down to the local distributors having done it by themselves because they had the right to right. Uh, for whatever reason. So what is, pro as producers, what's the best process for when we're making our project in, in pre-production and production and post-production so that we can give you what you need um, to ensure the project gets, you know. Take, take a hard and, and, and lucid look at your credit obligations memo. Because, you know, if, if you uh, aren't enforcing uh, not only um, size ties and, but likeness ties, uh, credit ties that, you, you will nip the problem in the bud if, if you're on top of it. Um, I actually don't remember, remember the specifics of the 12 Years a Slave example, but I know that film has Brad Pitt in it. And um, you know, I, I, can, I can see that, that it would be hard necessarily for a producer, even though, I mean, the people who made Plan B, Plan, uh, Plan B it's literally some of the best producers in the world, but it's hard to, to, to say, well, you know, you know, Chiwetel has, has likeness ties with Brad Pitt. I can see that's a hard conversation to have, but I think it's a necessary one um, to have um, and, yeah. and right in the very beginning um, so that, that even if there is a, 
a territory out there that is going to go on their own um, misguided mission to, to resize it for what they think their audiences want, they will not be able to do so. And that, that really does come down to, pro to producers. Mm -hmm. I'll add that like, you know, as a producer, what you can do is obviously, I'm sure Kenny will back me up a hundred times because you have a lot more to say about this than I do. Tons and tons of great stills from set, professional, good looking stills of all of your cast, including the ones that, that you would like to focus on the most for art, but also getting the right kind of sales agent on board who will, who understands the film and make sure that it then goes on. Or if you're dealing with distributors and not with sales agents, then making sure you're dealing with the distributors who understand your vision and what you're aiming to get and not somebody who will just minimize your vision, minimize the most important piece of success and focus on something different entirely or to market your film very, very differently. So that's a very much of a judgment call. It's very subjective and it's hard to negotiate sometimes with sales agents and distributors, but each project is very different. Yeah, I, one, one thing I can say is just in terms of the free advice today <laughs> to like, I think anyone producing a film, especially independent film that obviously, you know, doesn't have distribution yet and um, is to hire a stills photographer to actually shoot photography on your film. And it's one of the, it's, I, I hate to say it, but it's one of those things that in a way it feels like the last thing you have to think about because I understand is when you're in, when you're in production, it's like, we got to get this movie done, we got to get this movie done. But the reality is, is that, you know, um, a lot of times those stills are your only, unless your, unless your movie is going to get sold to like some, uh, you know, a big studio and they're going to do this big reshoot, which is doubtful, but let's just say more than likely not, that's going to be the only market that you actually have is like what you've shot while you're shooting this film. And a lot of you just don't like, realize and spend that time and they think about it sort of after the fact what happens with us a lot of times it's quite funny is that you know around december we get a bunch of calls from directors about sundance because sundance usually ends up letting people know really late that you've gotten into sundance and it's like we need a poster for sundance and we're like uh okay and then we're like well what assets do you have and they're like we're still finishing the film. <laughs> you know, like we're still making it great. <laughs> like, yeah, we, have a, we don't even have money for assets. It's like, what are you talking about? It's like, you know, yeah, but did you shoot anything? So um, I think, you know, scrape and scrap to like get someone to shoot photos of your cast or, you know, the story or whatever it is. That's like, I think just, you know. Um, even, even if it's your nephew with an SLR. Just... Yeah, even if, exactly. <laughs> like, I swear, it's just like anyone, anything. Uh, there's been so many times where, and you'd be surprised, even bigger films where you just, you, there's just not a lot of assets um, and you find yourself in a real it's sort of- so yeah, Kenny, Kenny, I think you've worked on some of ours that are in, in yeah. Made Miracle, in Made Miracles out of screen grab, so. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I think, yeah, I think that was the last movie we looked for you guys, Ken. I think it was a screen grab, I hate to say that. Oh, oh totally, yeah. totally, and that was not a small budget movie. I was like, what? And at the end of it, and they were, it was, they were supposed to have delivered stills. Yeah. It was a pre-buy. And right. I was like, what do you mean there's no, there's no stills? Yeah. So you kind of have to start really trying to work magic um, um, with screen grabs, which, and then, you know, people don't realize, but like, actually you, you can see the quality of photography and like it, but believe it or not, it clicks to you that the movie, there's a quality to the movie, but people just don't realize it. But when you see this great photography, like you immediately connecting that, oh, wow. The production of this film, the still like that it means more. People don't sort of like connect to that. They don't really realize that at the time, like how important how important it is. I, I'm a big proponent of uh, having a videographer at the same yeah. time. You no, know, a lot of them now will shoot stills and then shoot video. And mm -hmm. I guess with DVDs gone, pretty much, there's not that need for extra material. Although no, I see it still, still is. No, absolutely. No, there still absolutely is for BTS. It's it's still a thing, 100%. And it's got to be good for your electronic digital marketing. Yeah, thing, right? so, exactly. For social, for everything. It's like, you, you can't get, you can't have enough assets. I, I can tell you that right now. You just can't. It's like, there you go. yeah, you, you, that's the best way to explain it. You can't have enough. I need to like get your cast together back in costume, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. yeah like think about that. 
you know, it's like, you know, especially if you've got like a big costume piece, it's like, you know, if you're not shooting anything, you know, okay, you guys have wrapped, how are you getting those people back? You know, forget if you have like somewhat celebrities in there, they're onto other films. They're like cutting their hair, changing stuff. It's like, so it really is crucial to like get it while it's going on, you know? Um, and then, unless, again, it's a bigger, bigger production. Uh, that's helpful to you in your festival as well, right, Jeff? Ooh, uh, you're, you're muted. I was just thinking about what Kent said about the, the credit obligations uh, memo. That is the key to this. That's that's the golden advice. The only challenge is, Kent, as an independent filmmaker, right? So we, we've, I've probably seen a, a thousand movies a year, black movies for the last 20 years, whatever that number <laughs> multiplies out to. You really have the leverage as an independent filmmaker when you're negotiating, and, and Sana, you could jump in here if you like, when you're negotiating with the distributor, you're just so happy to get the movie picked up, right? Yeah. You really have the leverage. And I would, if someone called me and said, I'm, I've got a deal on the table and we're, we're talking about credits and how large the, the actor's you know, image can be, I would recommend they don't get into that because you, I, I think that only plays out when a producer's got a ton of leverage or you're doing a studio film. Can you, do you, do you, how would you respond to an independent filmmaker that, that was kind of forcing this credit obligations memo on you guys as a buyer. Is that something you would respond positively, positively, positively to? Is that for Kent and Sonnen? Yeah, just in general. I, I you know, as as a kind of a, a champion of the independent filmmaker, I just don't know if they would have the leverage to to negotiate that out with you guys. I I hate to say I'm sorry, I don't have experience with that, um, especially because I'm not in the acquisitions team. But I will say, you know, if it is a filmmaker who's had a previous release with us, which did really well, obviously they have a, a bit of an upper hand and we want to work with them. Or if it's like something that's like a really, really special project that we really believe in as a team and there's quite a few of those. Or uh, it's, it's, it's just, it's obviously a very, very commercial prospect. Then yes, there is a, there's totally leverage that the producer has, but um, it's like a pick your battles thing on both sides. Absolutely. Yeah. And Kenny, I was just going to add for you, you're a tremendous asset to festivals. And I don't know how much of this you've done, but I'd like to invite you to our festival because having that key art conversation is something that I don't think most indie filmmakers think about. Right. Yeah. And, and, and everything you said is true. And it's after the thing. You can't go back and do it once yeah. it's already gone. Right. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's definitely one of those things where it's and I get it too, that while, while it isn't something, because you're just trying to get a film finished. You know, it's like when you're an independent film producer, everything goes into the film. And as you know, a lot of times, and this is just a sort of, in a way, a lack of knowledge in regards to how things work um, in terms of marketing, um, it, you actually put yourself in a better position to sell your film if you actually have assets, if you can even, even to the to a place of, and we've done this before with certain filmmakers, where you're actually able to have some creative that, you know, in selling your film, like in, like you actually, there's a, there's already a voice, there's already a language that goes when you're trying to get distribution, you know, it, it can make a difference. Great. Uh, can we then talk to uh, <clears throat> what producers, you know, you don't know what you don't know until you don't, get it <laughs> what should producers ask for in their <clears throat> distribution deals um uh, uh, can't you you had mentioned a term that i have never heard and um what are some of the things that they should start to learn i, I found some information regarding negotiations and i'm going to ask uh, linda to put it up in the chat for everybody but how do we educate ourselves as directors and producers and to, to communicate with you in the terminology that um, it makes you at least think we know what we're doing, <laughs> but helps no, us. Sure. What doing. I mean, what I, what I was speaking of too about um, the, the credit obligations. And so, so a size tie, size tie, likeness tie. So for example, if you have, um, you know, a, a white actor and a, and a person of color and as your two leads um, at the very beginning, when you're doing their deals, each, each, uh, agent uh, or uh, who's re negotiating those those performers deals will put in some language as to um, what obligations the eventual distributor has if there's not a distributor on there or the distributor at, the, at that time 
um, we'll, we'll have to abide by in terms of what, what the marketing materials look like, particularly the key art. Sometimes there's language around the trailer, but it, you know, very frequently it's rather, it's rather key art. So when I, when I speak of likeness ties, for example, if you have your, uh, uh, your, your, your actor that's a person of color that has a likeness tie to your white actor, that, uh, if that white actor is on the poster, the other actor has to be on there as well. Uh, a size tie is exactly what you think it is, that literally to measure the size of them, um, the size of their likeness, the size of their heads, the size of their bodies, to make sure that, that they're uh, the same size, or sometimes there is a ratio in, 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 that's involved. If, if, if for example, the, the person of color has a, large, a much larger role into really their film, there might be a, a ratio by which you have to abide by where that person has to be bigger. That all happens before, I, well, it's independent film, so sometimes deals aren't signed before the cameras roll, but usually they are. Um, th that all happens right at the very beginning, and those are the kind of conversations um, that if you're looking to present equity in, in marketing and distribution, that happens at the production stage, because that is a cascading effect that'll stay with the movie for the, for the rest of its the rest of the time it's out there. It can, is it possible that a distributor can try to override the credit obligations and say, no, uh, we don't accept this. This is not what we're going to do. It's possible, but it is, it, it is a series of requests that it is, there's, you know, you could try to make it conditional. You could try to, 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 to use muscle, but at, at the end of the day, a deal is a deal. Um, and it is more than likely going to stick if that is what the actors and the producers have agreed to at the very, at the very beginning. Um, the, the last thing I mentioned was 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 credit ties, which again, um, you, you probably can figure it out. But it's if so if so and so is, is listed on the poster, their name is there. Uh, the other person has to be on there as well. Um, sometimes that you know it's above the title, below the title, whatever it may be, to to maintain equity uh, on a very contractual basis. That's that's all in there. That's that's you know regardless of of diversity, this is the kind of uh, game that that uh, agents play on behalf of their actors but there is a real impact on, on the way the film is presented to the marketplace that is very difficult to unwind if it's not taken care of early. Ooh, good lesson. Zana, that you find the same thing? Um, unfortunately, again, I can't speak to this because I'm not in acquisition. So I haven't had to deal with this myself. By the time the films come to me, all of this has already been discussed. But I believe generally the 90% of the movies we deal with are independent and small where a lot of this stuff won't have been written in because the actors, frankly, just maybe are not big enough or not represented by the kinds of agents who would be pushing for this sort of thing. So, hmm. so yeah, I guess this gives you a good like <laughs> spectrum on like the different kinds of films, the different kinds of companies that are represented here um, and what kind of films they deal with because we actually, I think, deal with very, very different films. There is some overlap, but for the most part, I would say not. And the things that you're talking about um, in the posters and the, the promotion, um, there are things to ask for like comparable travel and PR budget for your star press tour. Uh, those are the things I, I think enhance ticket sales, right? They, they can. Um, you know, I, I will say that uh, honoring film festival obligations during the pandemic has certainly changed. Certainly changed. Um, but yes, I mean, I, I will say this, that um, most companies have a firm policy for how they fly talent around. Um, and if you're a lead actor, it should be the same for, for everybody, um, you know, almost, almost across the board. That, that it, it can make a difference. It, sometimes, you know, flying talent to X premiere or X event and something like that is an exercise in, um, in you know, them just wanting to be there and not necessarily marketing. I would say that sits a little bit outside of this conversation in terms of diversity. Um, I would always encourage producers to have a very, um, you know, uh, active sense of, of what they think is going to help the film. Um, you know, having uh, uh, 25 of, of the actors flown to uh, Venice for a, for a film festival, I, I guarantee will make it very hard <laughs> for any distributor to, to float that cost. Um, so I, I would always make sure that you, you try to keep those costs as, as reasonable as possible uh, and figure out what is actually going to maximize uh, your presence on the ground. And Jeff, have you seen um, that be um, uh, helpful in, in ABFF in the sense that um, when talent shows up, it just brings and enhances people's attraction to the film 
and cells ab ab it. Yeah, absolutely. But again, this is the other end of the spectrum. You know, typically in an indie, indie space, you have basically the talent and, and the filmmakers coming at their expense. But certainly from this from the standpoint of getting the audience excited, and we, we, we run an audience. There are a couple of types of festivals. Obviously, there's the, the markets. We have a very audience-oriented festival. And the, our theory is, if you show your movie to a very monolithic group of people who might be just industry people, you don't really get a sense of what audience responses are going to be. So we try to put the most diverse audience in the room so the buyers are a bit more informed than they would be at a at an industry festival. So we consider ourselves a hybrid. But to answer your question, Deborah, filmmakers at that point are flying on enthusiasm. And in most cases, at indie film, at true indie film festivals like ours, the entire cast would be there and been and they would come at their expense. But it'd be certainly be helpful to create some buzz and awareness around the movie. Um, so many film budgets are based on past performance at box office. Um, so in the with the increase in distribution through the streamers who have not been willing to share their data with the industry of who's watching them and how many people are watching them. Um, is there a way to assess how the market is is strategically limiting the film? Um, and, and how does that impact the budget of future films that that producer or director or star want to do? And I guess the bigger, biggest question is, have, have you seen an uptick in the budgets for films directed by uh, BIPOC creators? I mean, I, I think absolutely there's been a sea change in um, the kind of films that are getting made. Um, and that the, uh, I, I think that you have, you have a, a beautiful combination of films getting more expensive um, as there is a, a greater desire for, for content across the, the streaming and traditional spaces all at once. Um, there's more things, you know, gearing up for production this summer than I think anyone can really remember. Um, and that, that I think is being married with um, a, a you know, movement towards really prioritizing more diverse voices. Um, so you have, you, have a, you have a combination of there being a greater willingness across the industry uh, and a greater priority for that, uh, for, for that being something that, that people want to make happen with a, a greater appetite for content overall. And I think that, that that's gonna to continue to accelerate. In both international and uh, there's a question from uh, the Hideaway Entertainment that says, on average, how long does it take the international market to catch up to North America? So applying what you just said, do you think that, that what we're doing is, is kind of the forefront of where everybody's leaning? I, I think, yes, I think that, that the U.S. is certainly leading. I would also credit the U.K. Um, on, on really beginning to prioritize emerging voices. Um, I think that, that uh, the BBC Film and Film 4 on their development slates have done an ab absolutely outstanding job in bringing some great movies um, from, from diverse creators forward. Um, as for the rest of the world, um, one is, I think it varies territory by territory. I think just to some, uh, some uh, uh, to, to Jeff and... At Kenny's points, there are some some countries that are slower than others, and some areas of the world that are slower than ours, others. And I will say that the, one of the great things about um, the, the the shift to streaming is an emphasis on a worldwide model, where it doesn't necessarily matter if that's coming from an inter, uh, international or not. It is going to be uh, eventized on a worldwide basis. Um, that you know, when you have a uh, a Netflix movie or show that that is coming out as a priority for that streamer. It's going to be everywhere, regardless of where it was produced, uh, whether it was, it was, it's American, Italian, Korean, what, 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 what have you. It, it will be everywhere uh, in hundreds of millions of homes. And I think that's only really a good thing. Even though they're competition and they're slowly, you know, doing what they are to the theatrical space, I think it's only, it's only a good thing. So territories won't be as important as they are now, as things trend in the direction that you're you're talking about. I mean, do you all feel that way? Well, um, I just define territories, but go on. No, go on. please do define territories. Not define, but like define what came after territories, sorry. Like, will they be as important? Was that well, because of streamers, because streamers are so global and they're already in those specific territories. Uh, you can find a Swedish uh, series yeah. or film 
on uh, Amazon or Netflix or anything like that. So what I'm wondering is, um, as the market is shifting, who knows what happens when COVID ever goes away, um, what, what will define territories? I mean, I think some of the language may change. And I'm wondering if you feel the same way. Well, I don't because um, independent producers can't always bank on a streamer swooping in to pick up your film and taking care of a whole bunch of territories. Even if they do, they may not take the whole world, um, which would be nice and easy for you, especially if it's a lot of money. So you kind of have to cobble together a whole sort of distribution strategy for yourself as an independent filmmaker. This can this can mean like a hundred different things. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, with, with one distributor, you get a certain territory, another one, you get a different territory. And uh, as a filmmaker, it helps to be up on what each territory is into. I mean, it's very, I think it's very simplified to look at it as like catching up with the US because this is the rest of the world we're talking here with a, all of their cultures and all of their various different um, entertainment models. So India obviously has its own, you know, system uh, and just industry. The UK has one, but it, it tends to really, really follow what's happening in the US as does Canada, as does Australia, because it's a similar sort of culture and it's English speaking. But everywhere else, I mean, you know, you name it, it's different. So no, I think in, uh, unfortunately, territories will still have to be something you really have to focus on and think about. Or if as a filmmaker, you can't delve into this because you don't have time, you have to make your movie, um, then this should be your sales agent or the distributor in that territory. They should be the people who know how to market into that territory, how to sell it and how to get it seen. And whether it's even realistic, if they, for example, if a certain distributor buys or gets the rights to all of Asia, they might say something like, I'm sorry, but I just really don't think this film is gonna work in Southeast Asia and here's why. And they might be right, you may have to listen. So. So what, fit, what territories are favorable to BIPOC content that you've found? Well, I guess if, if it's obviously it's Hispanic talent, then of course that'll be really famous or really work well in Latin America and South America. Um, I have not personally, uh, you know, distributed into Africa. So I can't really say if, if uh, content featuring black actors will work really well out there. Um, personally, the ad supported model that I work in is not as sophisticated or not as evolved in territories outside of the US, UK, Australia, and Canada, and Western Europe. So we won't really focus on those territories personally. But again, this is just a small part of the independent distribution model. This is just what I do. Um, I guess I'm, I'm also asking, um, for example, since we're talking about people of color, uh, Reggae Jean Page, I believe, is British and Zimbabwean. And uh, Tessa Thompson also has African in her thought. Is that something, and this goes to you, Kenny, um, is that something that can be played up when those markets are assessed uh, and, and distributed to? Is that something that people look for? We, we're becoming such a, um, uh, what's the term I want? I mean, there's so, so much variety in, in Black people. Sure. I mean, one of the things too, you know, marking right now, you know, is we can't ignore is social. You know, like we can't, like, you know, like when you talk about Tessa Thompson, you know, Reggie, it's like, you know, you also look at like what their reach is, you know, it's like, I hate to say it, but like, you know, like what's their Instagram reach? What's, you know, so all those things now are coming into play in terms of like how they're, you know, they're being marketed and how their films are being marketed. You know, it's sort of like, you know, when you when you when you're Dwayne Rock Johnson and you have 220 million followers, you know what I'm saying on Instagram, you know, you know like the reach, you know what I'm saying, of like, and I'm sure there's analytics behind Dwayne in terms of like where those followers are, like you know, where most of them reside and, and vice versa. So all those things are starting to come into play in terms of these celebrities and like what their reaches are. So I do think that um, they could, 
you know, affect things. It's like in regards to places like Africa and stuff like that. I think it could, but I still think we're we're still far from that. Um, you know, I still think obviously like the territories that you guys mentioned are still like the main ones that are still driving things. But I'm not sure that's you know, you know, things can change, and I think will eventually change as things become more global, as these streamers uh, are having more success with series that are succeeding globally. You'll, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll see a change, you know, that's for sure. I, I'm very encouraged with uh, the global embrace of black films over the last couple of years, Deborah. You know, if you look at like Hidden, Hidden Figures to me is the film that just, I just, if I had to make an advice, I would not, probably would not have greenlit that movie if I were head of a studio, just based on what it was about. It, it just, for me, I, I like to think I can predict what's gonna work, but that's one I just completely missed. <laughs> and for that movie to do, I don't know what it did domestically, but it was over a hundred. Uh, and I think it did like 70 I think million. It was, I think it was over $136 million or something. 136 and then like, then can't like 70 million globally, right? For me, when I see that and I see Glo Jordan Peele's work just kind of do 70, $80 million globally. And, and I think there was one, oh, Moonlight. I think Moonlight had a larger had a larger global box office than it had a domestic box office, and all these are very these are like really black movies, right? And so for me, I'm really encouraged. And indie thing is very different, but I'm really encouraged when a studio leans into blackness and and the authenticity of the black the black American experience. You know, we we got some recent comps or some recent examples where these films have really done well outside the U.S. and primarily driven, I think, and I'm no expert in this, but primarily driven by Europe, you know, the U.K. and France and Italy uh, and the Netherlands, right? But I think we're in, a good, we're in a good place, you know, I think we're in a great place where we've proven over the last couple of years, and you got to take last year out of the conversation, right? But if you go back to 19, 18, and 27, and then Black Panther was in 18, I think. So I think we're in a, we're headed the right direction in ter terms of what I call the globalization of, of Black content. Because I remember many years ago, 25 years ago, when I started ABFF, talking about black films don't travel, you, you, it was it was nauseating. Mm -hmm. All you would hear was black films don't travel. That's oh my it, God, you know. yeah. but but every but here's the thing, and I would say, well, why does black why does hip hop travel, and why does black fashion travel, and why did jazz travel, and, like everything black travels, right? <laughs> you just got to give some effort to it. everything black artistically at some point travels, and I think that we're at a place now as we talk about the sea change. Uh, where black cinema might be prime if, if the powers that be in our industry really get behind it. Um, and I, we, we, don't, we wanna prove that black cinema, and I'm only talking black, I know this conversation is beyond that, but my particular you know, space is the African-American space. I think that, uh, that films of color will absolutely travel and there's some recent proof of that. And actually, I, I wanna say something in regards to that as well on, on my end of things is that, you know, one of the things that I'm hoping is that there is more Black marketing executives at the studio. Um, because the reality is, like, when you, you want to talk about authenticity, you know, um, what are we talking about, right? We're talking about directors like Melina Matsukas from like Queen and Slim that have very certain visions, not just about their films, but also about their marketing. And it's sort of like if there isn't people at the studio that can connect to that. Uh, <laughs> okay. If there isn't um, people at the studio that can connect to that, then that's also a challenge because the reality mm -hmm. is not only um, do we want the content moving, but we also want the marketing to also be authentic. Right. You know? So that's like really super important. Um, and, you know, I feel like that also adds uh, just a lot of value to the project when that can, when that can actually happen. Um, um, and that, you know, you, you're going to need more diversity going on at the studios, in the marketing departments, so forth, so forth. So, you know, it's, it's all Yeah, to be able to realize that. Great. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's like, you get people like, you know, people like Spike Lee, who are very sort of um, outspoken about things like that, you know, uh, like wanting people of color to work on his poster or wanting, you know, more people of color in marketing departments. and. You know, um, you know, Spike, obviously he's Spike and he's, you know, in a really powerful position, but there's, you know, how many Spikes are there? Do you know what I'm saying? It's like he can, a lot of times he can push for that, you know, but, you know, the average young director 
um, you know, isn't going to be able to push for that. You know, they're not going to be able to. So hopefully that starts to change as well. I have a, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Sana. Real quick, I get the sense that because of last year, a lot of corporations, companies, studios are jumping on this bandwagon. And at times it can feel really, really insincere. Mm. However, the results so far, almost a year on, has been quite good. More and more people of color being hired in higher positions at Netflix or things. Sure. And whether the intention <laughs> was to uh, actually do it for a good reason or not, kind of gets lost in the mix for, for not for better, but for worse. But the result, I think, has just been better. Um, and that has helped me. A lot of the people that I'm selling to, a lot of these ad-supported platforms, they are looking for more and more diverse content, especially Black content. So that gives me hope. That makes me happier. Uh, and again, I wonder so much about their intentions. But then I think I just have to set that aside and 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 yeah. go with it. <laughs> go yeah, with the flow. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's important. I feel like go with the flow. Yeah, I'm I'm absolutely beyond that. You know, in terms of intentions, it's like for me, it's like, you know, you know, we actually had. Uh, just to be very transparent about it, we actually had someone that I just hired for our own agency um, who was a black creative director, and there aren't many of those. And reality was before he started, he had asked me about another position, uh, which was at Apple. And I literally said to him, I said, listen, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll call that person at Apple and we'll try to get you that job. And if it doesn't happen, we'll hire you. But here's the thing, if it does happen, you should take that job. And sure enough, he actually was with us for a month and Apple came in and actually offered him. And I actually had a conversation with my staff and told him, like, <laughs> you know, this does suck for us. You know, he's only been here a month, but it's more important that he actually goes to work at Apple. So it's really important that you guys understand that our agenda, that this is super important that he actually does take this job, you know? So, um, so yeah, hopefully it's starting to happen more and more. Uh, it makes me think too, when you're saying that, when you talk about merchandising, when you talk about product placement, um, how uh, effective is product placement in some of these films that helps you, um, A, bring, it brings money to the film, but it also brings an association to do marketing outside of a straight marketing uh, avenue. Do you like it? Do you not like it? Do you feel it's a sellout? when you have to include Coke in your ad or? <laughs> I'll be honest, I'd be out of my depth talking about product placement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, me too. It's like, I feel like, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I mean, usually I only see that with really massive movies. You know, it's sort of like, yeah. you know, the all the tent poles kind of scenario. And I think you have to be really careful with it because I think it can come across really cheesy. Usually if it's done, it's done really subtly, I think. But yeah, I'm so it's kind of out of my depth too. It's just like, you know, We've done it so that well, we I think we've come across it. I can't name any specific examples, but like uh, an audience, a film comes with a certain audience or sponsorship or money from a certain organization or a company that is aligned with like the story of the movie or uh, or is somehow part of the movie. You know, and and that helps us get the word out. I guess you know, speak to that audience as well. If it's a brand or a corporation, then then we can market to them about this movie. It's just about getting the word out. So that can help but i think culturally it could i think depending on the project if it feels authentic right right it can work you know what i mean like if it feels like oh you know this truly is just like what this person would always wear anyway you know like it just feels authentic i think mm -hmm. potentially work. i think when it feels like it's selling to you is when it usually you know should die in the water. Um, I have got a couple of festival questions. Um, one is, this is a festival question. In regard to indie short films, what are some marketing tips that are important? Should the short film have its own social handle or does that matter? Website, et cetera? I would say all of the above, you know, I mean, for our purpose, I, I would say all of the above. There, there's, there's absolutely no reason that you don't use social media to build and, and not that we select films based on awareness, right? We are basically bar is artistic merit, right? But certainly doesn't help that there's that you build your own your own awareness campaign around your short film. So I would certainly use all those resources. I would use every free resource possible uh, as an independent filmmaker to promote my movie. 
especially a, especially a short film. Yeah, and, yeah, and speaking to, to Jeff's point, you know, at ABFF, you know, they have a partnership, if I'm not mistaken, Jeff, with HBO, which shows, you know, all these amazing short films. Um, and, you know, like, even something like that is such a catalyst for those directors. And, you know, obviously, just to name a couple, you know, this, this little director you might have heard of called Ryan Coogler, I believe. <laughs> you, beat, a, you, beat, you beat me to it. And <laughs> a short, <laughs> and a short of Jeff's ABFF. And yeah. actually, just so you know, Jeff, someone who I spoke to yesterday, who's working on a new Transformers movie, a guy named Stephen Capel, oh, yeah. also had a short. At That's right. <laughs> so it just shows you, you know, it's like, however you can get, uh, whatever you can do to um, show your short in a, in a place, you, you, you know, it's so important. Like whatever you can use to, to push, push what's happening, it's so important. I mean, yeah. even the, the, recently, The Two Distant Strangers. Like, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, but I hadn't heard of that short until maybe about three months ago. And all of a sudden, socially, it was on wildfire because Puff, uh, like Diddy, and a bunch of other people were starting to push this short on their social. And, um, you know, and I had never even heard of it. Um, and it felt like it just, there was a swell on that short. And I'm not saying that's why it won the award, but it won it won the Academy Award. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that's why, but I'm just it's saying right. it, it was as hurt. well in the last few months. And you know, I'm a voting member, and it's like all of a sudden I was like, whoa, this film is like hitting me, you know. So it does show you. And so what are what are the social media besides YouTube and Wildfire? What are some of the other social media avenues that people can, you know, push to to get their viral uh, outreach going that you have responded to or dealt with or looked at or I know. I, big... I think it's all of them. I really do. I think whether it's Instagram or Twitter, I think it's, it's wherever, you know, you can um, push people to sort of repost and re. I mean, that's how that works, right? It's like from what you're pushing gets reposted by someone, you know what I mean? It's just like, and from then on, it, it keeps going and keeps going. Like I told you about that, Two Distant Strangers. I had not heard of it. I literally, I had not heard of that film like three months ago. And it felt like in the last two months. It, it was everywhere. Yeah, it was just everywhere. everywhere. It was on Netflix. Netflix bought it. It was like, it was everywhere. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, yeah, I don't know. I think that that's, a, I, I do think more than ever, there is bit, there's opportunity to promote your work, your film, before it's been distributed more than ever before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, mean, I think that's really important. That's why I think, mean, you know, having assets, having imagery, you know, where, whatever it is to help support is so, is so important for your project in, it, in, its, in its embryo state of being made at least. Festivals, this is another um, uh, comment from um, our group. Festivals are gatekeepers, curating content for distributors, but many festivals also need to make money and tend to accept films with established talent. How can festivals, um, how can festivals get more diverse films into its pipeline? That's a great question I'm, and I'm glad they asked it. Um, our festival, and, and I do agree with that in general, but our festival is an underdog festival. I think that every filmmaker, every new filmmaker is not kind of on an equal playing field as it relates to resources. Not, it is not really about race, not black or white or anything else. It's about, typically it's about money and resources and know-how. And what we've tried to do, and I hope this answers the question, but what we've tried to do is to be a place where you don't have to have the perfect award, Oscar award winning movie to play. And I've seen people like Ryan Coogler that, that Kenny mentioned and, and, and Stephen Capel Jr. And if there's a producer, I'm sure he's a member, Will Packer. Will Packer is, is you know, made a billion dollars in box office so far. And, and I remember 19 years ago, he submitted his first movie to me. And this is when we didn't have a big staff like we have now. And I remember the movie, it was called Twa, and it wasn't great. And I'm not embarrassing him, I'm celebrating him. And we looked at the movie we, and we just saw, and we met him and we, and we saw potential. So our mission is really about 
the filmmakers that don't have it all together right now and providing a platform for the world to see the potential in them, you know, and more times than not, we, we've been right about it. Will Packer did, did, has done pretty damn well as, as a producer in our industry. And his first movie would not have made Sundance. And no disrespect to Sundance. You know, like, like I said, all indie filmmakers don't come in with the same bag of resources. And we, we've just tried to be sensitive to that fact and be as supportive as we can about people's emergence in our, in our space. And everyone can't afford to go to you. I love USC and NYU and, you know, UCLA. Everyone can't afford to go to film school. It's $80,000 a year. So I do think the film festivals have a real role in nurturing. And that's really, nurturing is in our DNA. And, and when studios like, or distri distributors like Sonus Company, when they come along and they start to buy our movies up, when others, when, you know, when the bigger ones say, you know, you don't have stars, it really does help the narrative, right? It really, so we all need to kind of work a bit more in hand in hand because these filmmakers deserve a shot. I've seen too many people go from nothing to something in 18 months. <laughs> You know, like, you know, and, and Ryan Coogler might be the best example of a person who did a short film, got, you know, he won our HBO short film award and, and never looked back. Mm -hmm. There've been some other ex examples of that. Uh, Ken and Sana, how, what's the percentage of, um, what is the percentage of festival buys? You, you're not an acquisition, son. I, I understand that. But then, how, then uh, for you, it's how do you use the films that you have? Do they ever go back to festivals? Do ever do you ever use the festival circuit to enhance them, or to make people aware of them? I'm. I will quickly say I'm sorry. I don't have the answer to that. Um, but I can get back to you later <laughs> if I ask my teammates. But. Um, uh, but a, quite a lot of them are festival buys and we do hit up all of them and um, do aggressively look at what's going on and it's not just the big ones. So then, and I love that. I love that so much that we really support the indie filmmaker um, and are transparent with them with the, the data that's coming in. We have a new site where a filmmaker who has a movie with us can just log on and see what platform is it working on? How much money have I made? Is it working or not? And um, it, it's wow. a bit of a novel concept for me to have a produce a, a distributor who really looks out for the independent filmmaker. So it's it makes me very happy. Wow, that's a good advantage. Um, and what about you, Kent? Is there a percentage of festival acquisitions? I, I think we're probably 50 50 movies that we come on to in an early stage where we're involved at you know script and, and are part of the finance plan. Uh, in films we see at a film festival. And then there's a, there's only a handful really that we've ever uh, acquired, finished that that didn't uh, debut at a, at, a, at a film festival. Uh, and then a lot of the ones that we do come on to early, we we tend to um, to bring to a film festival before, or to many film festivals before we release it uh, theatrically. So there's there's not a hard and fast ratio, but it tends to average around 50-50. Around 50-50, around that's, a, that's a really good number. Um, because you guys are doing, you're working on so many levels um, between acquisition and the films that you produce yourselves. So that's exciting. Okay, wait, I have another question from the audience. Um, they say, uh, anonymous in attendee, say your name, say your name. I don't know much about ad supported distribution. What percentage of the distribution pie is ad supported? How long does a film stay on an ad supported platform? Is that a good route for an indie that didn't get a big theatrical or streaming deal? So uh, the last and the question to the, the answer to the last question is a big yes. It is a great, great way because um, ad supported or AVOD or you know advertising video on demand is a huge new avenue. It's been around for like maybe five or six years, but has started to really pick up speed in maybe the last year. And, and it's uh, and it's become just a, an excellent route for filmmakers to make some money off of um, films that maybe didn't get a uh, a deal with Hulu or Netflix or for Showtime or whatever, and didn't get um, a theatrical. Um, and what was the other question again? How long does it stay up? It really just stays up in perpetuity. So as as long as it needs to, there's no there's no rules. It's a bit of a wild west. So we're really making up the rules as we go along, and right. there's that which is a really exciting place to be in. Um, what were the other one? I have the question here too. 
what percentage of the distribution, it really just depends so much on the film. It depends on your distributor. Does the distributor deal with these ad supported channels or not? The big ones being um, obviously Tubi, Pluto are the biggest ones. Again, these are two companies that started out a few years ago on their own, but have now been bought up by giant studio conglomerates because the studios know a good thing when they see it. They know that this is worth the investment of millions when they bought them. So it really depends so much, again, on whether your distributor deals with them. It depends on whether your film is right for that kind of platform. And uh, that's, that's pretty much it. If you think that your film is really right for that kind of audience, that kind of channel, then that's something to discuss with a potential distributor. Like, do you have relationships with this, this, and this, and this kind of channel? And would you uh, advocate for my film? Or would you make it sure that it gets up there or not? So. Do you, uh, uh, do you all agree with that? I, cer I certainly do. There, there have been a number of films that I've been exposed to that have, that have done fairly well on AVOD platforms as kind of as a last resort, you know, to not getting a more major distribution. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a supremely fast growing part, part, of the, part of the space. I mean, it's leaps and leaps and bounds uh, year over year. So I think it's only we continue being a larger part of the pie. That's exciting. I mean, I, I really see where um, where marketing and distribution can can give legs to to films and let people start to see and, and other areas too where you you have a successful film that becomes a book or becomes a play or becomes you know there's life to um, to being a creative that that goes on. It doesn't have to stay in that format. You can, you know, coming from series television, the idea of being able to reinvent it five years later or 10 years later, um, I think is very empowering for, for an artist. And then to have it find new avenues of uh, access to, to the public. Um, okay, being a futurist, kind of into time travel on my background. Uh, I, I wanna ask each of you what you think in the next six months, two years, the outlook for distribution will be. Are there, there are trends that are just ticking up that we should take notice of? And it's especially when they relate to BIPOC uh, content. It's kind of words of wisdom. I think BIPOC content will break new records, take take out Black Panther off the out the conversation. Um, black films have traditionally been very profitable because the price points of producing those movies have been extremely low. Uh, I think the data will show that diverse films are very profitable. I also think beyond that, that the streaming industry will continue to, to change our business. And I don't predict, and this is a little bit radical, but I don't predict that we're gonna have as many new streamers as many people think we are. I think there's gonna be kind of a shakeout in the streaming business. And mm -hmm. I, I don't wanna predict the demise of any, any streamer that's currently existed, but it's a very expensive proposition. And I think the bar for, for competing with some of the big ones is so high that the streaming business is gonna become like the studio business was, you know, where you got, you know, three or four major players and, and they're gonna start behaving and functioning more like studios because most of them were created to not be studios. Um, if I have any disappointment around all the wonderful things that streaming has brought to our industry is, is that I, I see a shift towards kind of more studio oriented negotiations and, mm. and things like that, so that's that, my. That's, yeah. that, I actually really, I do agree with that a lot, actually, with the, in regards to the streamers. Um, I do see um, sort of the big ones starting to dominate even further. You know, when you start looking at Netflix and Amazon and like how much they're actually, how much content they're making, it's becoming hard to catch up unless you're who? Apple. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, so you have to think about like those names that are, that are coming. And then even when you mention like Hulu, you're not like, you're not really saying Hulu, you're saying Disney. You know, it's like, 
So when you think about all that, what do you have? You have Netflix, you have Disney, you have Amazon, you have Apple. In general, like those are like biggest brands on the planet. Do you know what I mean? And biggest pockets on the planet. Right, right. I feel like that's going to what Jeff is saying. It's like, I see that happening. But I also agree with Jeff regards to black content. I, I, I feel like it, that's just going to go up, you know, and that's kind of like why, going back to my point of where there needs to be more diversity in studios, in marketing and all those things. I just see more and more content uh, going to be produced, going to is going to happen. I don't see that slowing down because I also see the reality of the numbers connected to it um, being so clear. So, you know, again, I don't, I don't know about extra distribution. I do actually also think, and this might be a little radical to say, maybe it's because I'm a cinephile, but I actually see movies coming back. Um, you know, I don't, you know, I know a lot of people are like, oh my goodness, movies, it's dead, it's over, it's, you know, like, I, I'm not sure I 100% agree with that. It's like, you know, we're starting to um, feel more just theatrical films starting to come our way more. If you look recently, I know Warner Brothers freaked everybody out with this whole HBO Max thing. But if you notice, like, Godzilla versus Kong still made, like, 82 million. You know what I mean? Like, recently. And it's just like, I just feel like, eventually movies will come back. I feel it'll be different. I feel like it will be more event-driven films probably, but I do think that's going to still happen. I, I have to agree with, uh, with Kenny in so much that, you know, you see, you know, domestically you have examples like Godzilla versus Kong. I, I think you're also starting to see not necessarily event films connect. Um, you know, even, I, I will say this, I mean, we released a film last weekend um, that uh, listen, it's, it's a pandemic level success, but it was a success nonetheless. You know, we'll probably cross a million dollars box office this weekend for a film that's, I think it's, 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 not, it's not a big budget film by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and, you know, you could see audiences wanting to go to the movies. On a much larger scale, you could look at, at uh, countries that have gotten over the pandemic more quickly and have opened their theaters. And while obviously audience behavior is going, to, is going to change wildly from country to country, you know, there's a reason that parts of Asia are, are breaking box office records by dram in dramatic fashion because people were so starved to go back to the movie theater. That said, I don't know how long that will last. I would love to think it'll last for years and years and years. <laughs> it may be a short-term boom, but I, I, I certainly look forward to that for however long uh, it, it will last. Uh, and I think when, when the dust settles, that there's going to be, I, I think, uh, an agnostic sense of how movies go out and people are gonna feel like more aware of the choices they have of how they wanna watch movies. Because I don't think there are many people who want to go see Godzilla versus Kong who, who were confused that it, was on, that it was on HBO Max and they came home they're like, man, I should have just paid 15 bucks to watch exactly. this movie. Yeah. They, were, they weren't subtle in the marketing, <laughs> it was on HBO Max. So I think that, that that's, I think that's a really encouraging thing to see. Um, I do think that there's going to be a, uh, a window for theaters again. Um, it will certainly be shorter um, in, in, in most cases. I'm sure they'll be, they'll be playing more simultaneous releases, but I think that, that you're going to start to see a maturation of the space and a nuance in the space that will lead to, I think, a lot more diversity in, in terms of how movies come out, uh, and how they make money, and I think that in turn feeds what kind of movies that can get made. Because the more tools that financiers and, and distributors and studios and streamers have at, at their fingertips to find audiences, the, 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 the easier it can be to take a, 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 a film from a BIPOC creator, cast, what have you, and, and break it out and bring it to every audience across the globe. I personally want to go and see it on the big screen, as my my son always said to me. No, no, we have to see it on the big screen. So I miss that. Sana, you you have a, a vision? Oh, no, I was going to agree a lot with what Kent said. It's going to be a very, very different world. Um, I didn't have, I always think of it in terms of the independent uh, film uh, world. And I think that, unfortunately, the cinema experience will be relegated to these big movies. I wonder if the rest of you agree. Um, and that like it's only going to be the biggest independent films that get to play cinemas or theaters. Um, in the meantime, there's going to be more and more of a 
wide variety of the kinds of films that can come out, uh, the, the kinds of ways that independent films can come out. And by independent, I mean everything from like very, very small, low budget indie films to 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 the bigger ones that Bleecker Street has, for example. There's gonna be different avenues, which is very, very exciting. Uh, but I'm not sure all of them are gonna get the opportunity to play in theaters as they used to. And anyway, that was kind of going down anyway, prior to the pandemic as well. Very true. And, and right. I, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just, just that whatever, um, whatever happens to the general mainstream set of uh, films, where in terms of when I say mainstream here, I mean like featuring mostly white actors, it's probably going to filter down to BIPOC as well. So the BIPOC films will just be a microcosm of just like that bigger one. So it'll just be that in a, on a smaller scale. Does that make sense? Well, you, we look at what took best picture and that kind of tells us that people love small movies. They love intimate stories. Um, I, I want to thank you guys very much. I want to thank our panelists, uh, Donna, Kenny, Jeff, and Kent for sharing your wisdom. And um, I want to give a special thanks to Stephanie uh, Dawson and Julie Evans and Julie Goldstein and the PGA and Wynn. Um, and everybody that came out tonight, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. So uh, important to know, speaking of emails, keep an eye out for the next session, Institutional Change for Equity. And that's June 3rd at 5 p.m. Um, Pacific, 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. Mark your calendar and look for the invite for PGA. Um, we're going to end the recording and you guys rock. What a pleasure. Thank you for talking with me tonight. Thank you. I look forward to meeting you in the real world. One day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Bye.